Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining another Barometer Readings webcast. I'm Pamela Hastings, Relationship Manager here at Barometer. And joining me today, as always, is David Burroughs, our Chief Investment Strategist and President at Barometer Capital. On today's webcast, we will provide a brief macro overview and, of course, be delighted to address your questions at the tail end of the conversation with David. So don't be shy. Email me at phastings at barometercapital.ca or hit me up on the Zoom Q&A or chat. Now, David, last week we discussed the prospect of a near-term bounce. Certainly the markets have been performing a little bit better this week. So we're looking forward to getting your thoughts on that and where you think the market is headed. So with that, I turn the conversation to the one and only David Bur Burroughs. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Pam. Hi, Pam. Thanks for hosting. And thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, yeah, it, it, obviously last week we reached some kind of a crescendo uh, with the Fed rhetoric uh, after the hot CPI data about three weeks ago, uh, there was a significant selling pressure on markets with the prospect that the Fed may have to take a more aggressive stance, uh, may have to raise rates higher, uh, and they certainly have jawboned over the last two weeks to try to get the market ready for what they believe will be a sharp rate cycle. Now, you have to keep in mind that the Fed's job is to get it through the psyche of the market, that conditions are going to be tighter, to cause it both investors uh, and uh, capital allocators that they might want to reconsider their capital allocation plans in the face of higher rates, and to do it as quickly as possible before there is significant damage to the economy. So what they have accomplished is that they've got the terminal rate or the expectation for rates a year from now or two years from now to a level that might be commensurate with slowing the economy and kind of cooling off inflation. So the rhetoric got the bond market to the right spot. The question is, you know, when will the inflation data start to cool? When will we see weakening economic data? The market clearly expects that. Um, and to what extent. And so for that, we spend our time going through the indicators that we use, uh, spend time looking at the health of various asset classes to try and make assessments and make sure that the portfolios are sort of positioned in the right spot. And needless to say, it's been a very difficult year so far. Uh, fixed income was under pressure off the hop. NASDAQ was under pressure off the hop. Uh, over the last three weeks, some of the more inflationary assets uh, backed off some, certainly on the back of the belief that the economy could slow down. Uh, and so the question is kind of where to from here. To start out with, you know, as, as we always do, I think that we remain in a structural bull market, albeit we are in the middle of a sharp, short, short, sharp pullback. Uh, the pullback is commensurate with what we would see in a structural bull market. It's really not at this point at all commensurate with what you expect in a structural bear market. And of course, everybody wants to compare every sell-off to 2000 to 2002 or 2008 and 2009, because these are the disastrous markets that we remember. But the fact is, for the most part, during structural bull markets, corrections or consolidations or contractions, whatever you want to call it, are uh, confined to time and price that would be somewhat significantly less than what we would see in some of those big waterfall declines. But it's always a possibility. We always have to reassess and we always have to go through the steps to say, how should we be positioned and is anything changing? From a rates perspective, we know we believe we saw bottoming in yields in 2020, a generational bottoming likely. We did exceed the previous high from 2019. We broke the downtrend in rates that went all the way back to 1981. So clearly we did see a regime change. And we thought maybe at that point we might see some consolidation. Perhaps rates moving up that quickly, maybe a little too quick. And we saw the terminal rate as we talked about go to 4% for expectations for June of next year. And since then we've seen rates just kind of back off a little bit. Now it doesn't mean by any means that the rate, the, the, the rise in rates is over. It does mean that with rates pulling back a little, it could take some pressure off other asset classes. Uh, and, and certainly over the last week, we saw some pressure come off of equities, at least in the very short run. 
if we if we take a look at the point and figure chart on the basket of one to three year treasury bonds, we saw the price of the bond that bond basket fall uh, consistently through 2020 and 21 to make a low in June. And we've had a little bounce since then. But we definitely took out some pretty significant support in the bond market. And we think likely after a period of consolidation, maybe a little bit of a, an uptick in bond prices on the back of concerns around the, the economy, we probably have made that generational corner that we've talked about. On commodities, we talked about the relative outperformance over the last couple of years of commodities versus stocks. And that when that starts, it tends to go on for a long time. We know that there are fits and starts in every asset class, but since it made its turn on a monthly basis, one month by month, prices have marked their way higher. This is the RJI equally weighted basket of commodities. But in the last month, we have seen a reversal. We made a new high and we reached the low from the month before. That tells us that in the near term, probably the commodity market is ready to take a breath. And if we look at a day chart, of the Rogers Commodity Index. Certainly it's backed off over the last two to two and a half to three weeks from new highs, pulling back to still well above 150 and 200 day moving averages. And it may have some more to pull back, but there are strong commodities and there are weak commodities. Crude oil, which did pull back from over 120, pulled back as low as about 103. Today was trading at around 112, uh, holding that uptrend and this continues to look very constructive. Now we know supply is short. We know that there is very little new supply to come online in the immediate, intermediate term. We know that China is reopening. We know that travel is reopening and the demand for jet fuel has distillates or jet fuel at record prices. We know that the demand for energy is not going down in the near term. And, and on, on Brent crude, we've seen just a series of higher highs and higher lows as the market has been working its way higher. So at this point, the oil market continues to look very constructive and probably the strongest part of the commodity index. And realistically, it's probably the most important part of the commodity index. From a demand standpoint, I thought this was an interesting chart. And somebody asked me about this last week and I couldn't put my hands on the chart, but I wanted to put it up. The question is, as the sales of electric vehicles penetrate the market, will it have a significant impact on the demand for crude? And this has been a story for a long time. I thought this was a great example to look at. This is the example of what happened in Norway. Now, Norway was a very early adopter of electric vehicles. And over time, starting in 2012, the percentage of new car sales that became electric vehicles has steadily ratcheted higher to the point where currently, it's almost 70% of new cars that are sold are electric vehicles. So you would think that that would have a material impact on demand for crude in Norway. But the reality is there has only been a very slight reduction in the amount of crude demanded in the economy. Partly it's, it's because gasoline usage continues to be firm. There's a very large installed base of cars. The average car today lasts about 12 years. And as we're just moving through existing years of replacement, there's a very large backlog in behind. So just because we see EV adoption doesn't mean we see a significant reduction in crude, or at least that's been the experience in Norway. Of course, the demand for diesel also has remained very, very strong. So in the near term with the problem in the Ukraine and Russia, and the fact that we have had very little new production come out of the US because of the long bear market we saw in crude prices, the reality is the market is gonna to continue to be tight. So that probably flows through to the equities, but we'll have to see what the market has to say about that. From a gold perspective uh, in commodities, you know, gold has certainly corrected a little over the course of the year, but frankly, it's, it's about as, as good as it gets from an asset, asset perspective. It's basically flat on the year. It's a stock market and a bond market that have been badly beaten. So in fact, it has actually acted as somewhat of a hedge versus other assets, even though it's been a little bit boring. Copper, on the other hand, over the last two weeks, kind of took it on the chin. Um, after forming this nice consolidation over the last 
year, in the last two weeks, you can see we breached the support. Boom, boom, two weeks in a row. Now moving down towards a rising 150-day moving average. We'll have to see what happens here. From a point and figure perspective, it tells us that there probably is a little bit more downside. The long-term uptrend line is sitting at around 360. Copper sitting up here at around 390. Uh, there's a little bit of room further to the downside. And that makes sense given the fact that copper in the very near term is going to be impacted by the strength of the global economy. We know that China is coming back on, but we know that the U.S. economy is likely to slow down some. So in 2022, there should be a small excess supply. We know that from 2023 on, the world looks as though it will be in a deficit based on the demand for electric vehicles and copper markets are likely to be tight. So after this pullback, I would expect to see it work its way higher, but we have to respect the chart. We have to take down our exposure when copper tells us in the near term there's risk. Base metals as a whole have basically pulled back to the area that it broke out from over the last five years. Now we make our decisions based on process. It's not based on opinion. We've got two main sets of tools. One is some top-down tools that help us to assess market and sector risk, to try to identify pockets in the market that are seeing net new inflows of capital. And we wanna focus our attention in those areas. We don't have to be everywhere. The bottom-up work helps us to find specific securities that we can use to populate portfolios within the sectors and themes that are showing expanding breadth. And that's where the portfolio lives. But the fact is the market's a living, breathing thing. And we go through contractions and we go through expansions. And when we go through contractions, one of the most important tools we have to have is selling discipline. So it may well be that copper producers will be a great place to be invested over the next several years, which I believe to be the fact. But in the near term, the technical picture is murkier. And so we have to be prepared from time to time to step away. Of course, we use breadth models to make those decisions. And we're looking for areas of the market where we're seeing more and more securities participating. It's a healthy market. And where we see deterioration in breadth or where the percentage of stocks and uptrends is deteriorating, it tells us we got to be a little bit more cautious. We've got to tighten up our stop losses. If we get stopped out, no new money gets invested in that part of the investing universe until we start to see improving breadth again. So where are we? Let's go through it. Our job is to target market leadership. We don't need to be everywhere. We have to look for new leadership to emerge or old leadership to recede to help us manage our exposures in the portfolios. And sometimes we have to sit on our hands. So is it time to be doing that now? Last week, we talked about the fact that our short-term and long-term indicators all had shown deterioration. Percentage of stocks and uptrends in Canada, NYSE, and globally had been weakening since the beginning of June. Percentage of stocks trading above the 50-day moving average got to extreme lows, in fact, very extreme lows in the S&P 500. Percentage of stocks with positive weekly momentum showed a, showed a backup. Percentage of stocks making new highs versus new lows were falling. And the percentage of stocks trading above the 150-day moving average, again, falling. So what we said was, we believe that some of the short-term indicators are very sold out. We believe that sentiment and positioning is also very sold out and that we could get a near-term bounce. But we will say that the long-term models that we're using at this point don't allow us to put on new positions. So here's the S&P 500. We broke support over the last couple of weeks, going all the way back to the beginning of the rally in 2020. That was on the back of some sectors having deteriorated for over a year. And the fact is we want to look for bounces for opportunities to reduce exposure, not to add exposure. Well, last week we mentioned that the percent of stocks trading about the 50 day moving average got to 2%. That had only happened a couple of times in the past, but that in the near term, we were likely when that was the case to see a bounce. And it looks as though we have been getting some of that over the last few days. From an equity breadth perspective this week, percent of stocks above the 50 day did improve by over 6%. So 
same for all stocks globally. The rest of the short-term indicators remain pretty oversold and haven't given us any indication that this downward pressure is over. So it may well be that a bounce gives us an opportunity just to reduce some exposure to some of the poorly, more poorly performing assets. We do know that, that asset manager positioning is exceedingly light and commensurate with what we do see around market bottoms. You can see in 2015 and 16, it got to between five and 3% of total uh, positions outstanding. And we can see that in 2011, it got to 2.8%. We can see in 2020, it got to 5%, we're 2%. So this is part of what gave us the view that we could get a near-term bounce. Now, as of last week, when we take all of the major asset classes, commodities, lead, domestic equities from a relative strength were coming second, that's U.S. equities, cash third, international equities fourth, fixed income fifth. Of course, I think most, most people know we've been short fixed income most of the year, and then currencies. So this week, we did get some bounce. Market rallied from the lows last Wednesday. We had five up days. Today, the market's a little bit weaker. But there is risk here. Right? Market has been putting in a series of lower lows and lower highs, lower low, lower high. We did leave a couple of gaps behind, which we may go back and fill. But I do think that until we get above 4,100 or 4,200, you have to assume that rallies probably should be lightened up on. So counterintuitive when the market's been down hard over the previous number of weeks. But the fact is we have to look for opportunities to raise a little bit more cash along the way. As of this week, the asset class rankings change. Commodities continue to be the strongest category led by energy, but cash has overtaken domestic equities from a relative strength perspective. So we have the choice as to where to be. We don't have to be invested. The best thing to do is to hold a larger cash weight. Cash is going to be a larger weight. So we know that over the course of the year this year, it has been an inordinately difficult year for a 60-40 portfolio. People who had 60% equities and 40% cash, sorry, bonds, and had tried to keep a, a balanced portfolio. We have not been advocating for a 60-40 portfolio. We were largely invested in equities and commodities. We have had almost no uh, fixed income exposure over the course of the year. And global has been very, very small as a percentage of our overall equity weight. So let's talk about leadership. Well, the truth is energy does continue to lead. We've had a much more narrow drawdown since the, since the sell-off began. We've held against rising moving averages. Even the 50-day moving average is still just flattened out. Now it may well be that this gets worse. But my guess is based on valuations, which are exceedingly inexpensive for energy at $100 oil, that likely this group is gonna to continue to be pretty resilient. The XEG is the Canadian index of oil and gas producers. It's trading currently better than 96% of all companies in the S&P 500 in the last 12 months. And over the course of a week where the market bounced, relative strength quickly rallied. So it has been a sharp sell-off, but what we watch for when the market at least tries to put in a near-term low is what is it that rallies sharply? And then on a down day, what is it that holds up the best? Well, the NASDAQ was down 2.5% the last time I checked today, but the energy stocks were up sharply. It's great to see what bounces off market lows, but it's also great to see what is it that holds up better than the rest when the market sells off again. So many people might say, well, tech stocks have had a strong bounce over the last week. Maybe that's a bottom. Well, then today the market sells off and they've sold right back off again. That tells me that the strength over the last week was more short covering in tech than new long buying. When we look at the XOP index in the US, oil producers, again, a nice bounce in relative strength this week after a couple of sharp weeks down, trading still above the 150 and 200 day moving averages, which are rising. 
and we've got a commodity price in the background that's remaining quite firm. Now, um, not quite the same for the materials ETF. Materials ETF we talked about last week did break support and did pull back. It had a nice bounce over the last few days, did hold up much better than the market today on the market's weakness, and does have a lot of support where we traded in this range between May of 2021 and early 2022. So it should be lots of technical support in this area, but we did reduce our exposure as the materials ETF broke down. Base metals hanging in fairly well, better than 75% of companies in the S&P 500, again, pulling back into the major support, coming back 2021 into 2022. Again, pulled back enough that caused us to pull in our horns somewhat. Dividend payers, briefly broke below the 200 day moving averages, the FDL, uh, Morningstar Dividend Leaders ETF. Bounced nicely and did gain relative strength on the bounce, put in a low prior to the market's blow. That's a positive. We're back above the 200 day moving average, but I think that this is tenuous. It's one that we've got to keep a close eye on. And then when we look at, excuse me, when we look at the, the dividend, the commodity dividend payers, they did break support. They have rallied back up into support. And on this bounce, we did let a little bit more go. So other groups that we've been focused in, we've had a small weighting in insurance companies. They continue to have strong relative performance versus the market. They did break some support a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we also have some exposure, excuse me, to the defense sector, really continues to make new relative strength highs. Uh, we have a slightly larger exposure to the pharmaceutical sector within healthcare, making relative strength new highs, obviously on the fact that these have very little economic sensitivity. But now let's look at the groups that we've been out of and is there any real reason to change our stance? This is the basket of technology stocks effectively making relative strength lows. Quick to bounce, quick to sell off, no relative outperformance here. When we look at the uh, consumer discretionary ETF, FXD, same thing, continues to work its way lower from a relative strength perspective, clearly would be an area that would be hurt by an economic slowdown. The communication sector is a very similar picture. These are groups that we tried to avoid. And when we look at growth versus value, this is the RPG growth ETF, S&P growth ETF. Again, lower lows and lower highs. Where on the other hand, the RPV, the value ETF, has had a much better relative strength picture. However, equities as a whole have been weak over the last few weeks, and certainly it's been impacted as well. So if we take all of the sectors and rank them versus on a relative strength basis, energy and basic materials continue to lead even though they both have pulled back along with the market. Consumer staples have held in better based on their low volatility and utilities, financials and industrials. Then we go down the list of communication services, consumer cyclicals like the autos uh, and technology. We've talked about the fact that growth is relatively still expensive and inflation beneficiaries are relatively cheap. But it doesn't mean that if people believe the Fed will be have enough resolution to crack inflation, that these won't pull back. So we have to take the warnings. So here's where we sit today. As it is today, our largest weight across the firm is now 25% fixed income. Now, when I say that, it's 25% short-term bonds, roughly one year or less. Effectively, it's cash. And the fact is that on a rally, we pulled a little bit more money out of the market just to be a little bit safer. The energy component has come down about 10%. You have to heed the weakness overall in markets and equi uh, energy equities have performed a little bit worse than energy itself. Healthcare sits at 9% for the dividend that's attached and the low economic sensitivity, and the same for consumer staples and utilities. These are pretty defensive holdings. Communication services down at 5%, industrials at 4%, down a little bit over the course of the week, materials down at 4%. We have very little by way of real estate, consumer discretionary, and information technology. So our portfolios are really defensive. It's okay for us to sit on our hands and let the market sort this out. 
We don't have to put the money back right away. We can let the leadership emerge as we work our way out of the hole. It may be that this sell-off is over and that over the next two or three weeks, we'll see our indicators turn positive. And it may be that we'll see inflationary data start to slow and people will start to anticipate a pivot from the Fed. But we're not gonna try and anticipate when that happens, we're gonna let the market show us. Let's talk about valuations. Energy relative to history is trading at the best valuation it has been at in years. If you took a, pre a PE premium or the excess that it traded at versus the S&P 500, it's trading at a 40% discount to the S&P's valuation. So if we think that prices are gonna be sticky and we think that it's possible that a pickup in demand from China and a reopening in the world is gonna keep demand fairly firm, then why wouldn't we wanna own energy when it's trading as cheaply as it has traded in the last 30 years? The material sector is traded uh, trading in the 13th percentile versus history with a 15% discount to the S&P. And while we have a very low weight in financials, you know, it's trading only in the ninth percentile. We're somewhat cautious on consumer discretionary trading in the 88th percentile from a valuation perspective. And despite the sell-off in tech, it's still trading at a significant premium to the S&P at a 20% premium. Things outside of the US. We've talked over the last few weeks about the fact that it looks like the Chinese market bottomed back in April when the S&P was making lower lows in May and June, we started to add some small weights in our global macro portfolio. Now 11% of the portfolio, it continues to work its way higher. The Chinese have become very accommodated from a monetary policy standpoint and also from a fiscal standpoint. Chinese market turned over into correction well before the U.S. market did, and it may well be that their correction is over. The Japanese market, where they've looked for inflation for the last 30 years, they're finally seeing a little bit of inflation. Stocks are, are cheering, and they've held in remarkably well versus the rest of the global markets. We've got about a 5% weight here. So in our macro exposure, we have a large cash weight. and again. We'll sit on this cash weight until we see improvement in our equity breadth measures or improvement in fixed income measures or improvement in commodity measures. We've got a 19% energy weight. We've got a 12% weight in actual physical gold and silver as a hedge against inflation. We've got an 11% weight in China. We've got a 9% weight in materials, which is largely the miners. And at the other end of the spectrum, we are short US high yield debt. That's what we call junk. And we have a small short position against the S&P 500, which was initiated uh, after the market bounced. So this is a waiting game and we don't have to rush. We're gonna let the news unfold. We're gonna let the markets show us where the leadership is. My guess is if the market were to sell off for a couple of days, we would see some of the things that rallied over the last week back off more than the market, which would tell us that was short covering. When we see the market go through a bottoming period, we will see things rally and on weekdays hold. I was encouraged to see the fact that materials and energy held against a weak tape today, but that's one day. The fact is, we think that we're in a correction within a structural bull market and that likely both combination of time and price gets us closer to the point where we see a near-term bottom. The important thing to remember is what happens after those corrections. You get two to three year runs in equity prices and this is unlikely to be any different. In the 1950s and 60s, it was the same picture. This was a rising rate period from 1951 to 1966. Long-term bond yields went from 1% to 6%. But there were periods of correction in between the very significant rallies. My guess is the next rally looks something like this. And whether it starts in July or whether it starts in October, we're gonna wait, keep some powder dry, and let it start. So lots of news to follow. 
lots of interesting things coming from the January 6th testimony today. Lots of interesting things happening in the world of inflation. Lots of interesting things happening geopolitically. And that's why the market is where it is now. When we start to see some kind of easing in pressure from the Fed, when we start to see some kind of easing in pressure from inflation, when we start to see some kind of easing in geopolitical risks, or if we see companies continue to earn the kind of profits that they've been earning, the market will find its spot and start to lift. And we have lots of opportunity to build new positions on the way forward. Now, last week, I put this up to show just how difficult the beginning to this year has been. The market sold off from January, and this was until the middle of June. And at that point, it was the second worst performance of all years on record since 1928. We're really proud of the fact that we've hung in remarkably well against a very difficult market. What I tried to go on to say was when the market started very poorly, it often had a stronger second half. And we don't make decisions on what often happened, but it's good to know. So I got this data from our friends at Strategus Partners in New York. They listed the worst individual first halves of the year and what happened in the back half of the year. 1932 went down 41% in the first half, that 44% in the second. 1962 went down 26% in the first half, was up 23% in the second half. 1940 was down 20% in the first half, up 13% in the second. Well, market's down over 20% the first half. And we'll have to see, but if it's like any of these other years, it's more than likely that we get a stronger second half. When it starts, I can't tell you. We just have to watch and, and, and follow the data. So we will continue to get more defensive if the market continues to weaken. We'll look for new leadership. We will look for additional sources of stress in the market and try and protect against it. We will take an active approach. So as it sits right now, we've got an elevated cash weight. We have inflation-related assets to protect us in the event that inflation is sticky. And we have optionality in the flexibility that we have in the portfolios. So with that, Pam, if there's any questions, certainly happy to answer them. I see a couple of hands that have gone up a number of times. Uh, happy to take the questions. Yes, of course. Thanks so much, David. So we have first a question from Sebastian. He's wondering, David, do you see um, when specifically or where do you see the S&P bottoming potentially? I know you don't like to call that, but... Perhaps you can call yeah. It. Look, I mean, that's a that's a that's a really really difficult question. I mean, it's it's not impossible that uh, that we've seen it's it's not impossible that we've seen the lows. Um, I want to see if I can share my screen here. It's not impossible that we've seen the lows. Um, if if it is that this was a typical sort of one, two, three waves down uh, sell off. It may well be that we retest the lows in and around around uh, 3,600. And if breadth holds in better on the retest of the low than it did at the lows, and we get a good acceleration off that bottom, it may well be that that's it. But the reality is it probably is more likely that the market meanders around a bit here through the month of July, end of June, July, and that we retest the low maybe in August, uh, or September. I think that we probably have some time. We've had enough, enough sell-off that it could well be that the market has to form a bottom and there needs to be a little bit of technical work done. When we look at the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ obviously has had it worse. Um, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, we want to watch for signs as to what holds up better when the market retests lows. And that's why I was encouraged to see energy strength today and basic material strength today. Um, but certainly, uh, we have to we have to wait. I'm not going to try and guess when our breadth indicators start showing us that money is getting put back to work. We'll take advantage of it. one important thing to keep in mind over this week. There's likely a very large amount of equity buying has to come into the market uh, from uh, strategic asset allocators who have had a very difficult month in equities. Uh, it could be that there's 60 to $80 billion worth of buying that needs to take place before the end of the quarter. Um, that may help 
buoy prices in the very short run. Um, but again, like you, we have to put one foot in front of the other and we aren't going to forecast. Thanks so much, David. The next question, Lance is curious. David, can you comment on the agricultural sector? Sure. Uh, yeah, so so agriculture certainly backed off in the sell-off. Uh, we're sitting right here at around the 200-day moving average of the DBA, which is the actual agriculture pricing itself. Um, if you take a longer-term picture, you know, certainly we started bottoming in and around June of 2020. We had a consolidation period. It may well be that we're into a second consolidation period, um, but you can see that the long-term averages have turned higher. Uh, and, and likely this group looks pretty interesting. Nutrien in particular, if we look at uh, producers within agriculture, agriculture has probably made its natural pullback and looks like it's trying to find a near-term low in here. Uh, I know that there was a, a couple of firms published research on it today, talking about valuation. Uh, um, and uh, an upside opportunity, we'll have to see. But again, this whole group, the whole materials group has, has uh, been hit over the last two weeks. You have to take it seriously when that happens. It doesn't matter what our thesis is. If there's technical damage, we take some positions off. And we reduced our exposure to agriculture in the near term. Thanks so much, David. The last question we received this evening is from Lawrence. He's wondering, David, could you give us a ticker on one-year treasuries? One-year treasuries. Uh, well, uh, you know what? I don't have it. I don't have it in front of me. It's a one-year T-bill, actually, one-year bill. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, Here's a zero to one year. Uh, no, I, I don't have an ETF for that. I mean, effectively, you'd be looking at a money market fund. Um, you know, in Canada, we look at the short-term bonds using the XSB. And here we go here. Uh, and this would be a good one to track for Canadian rates. Uh, I'd, have to, I'd have to go looking for, I don't know of an ETF. Uh, or a tradable vehicle that's exchange traded that shows you a one-year bill. We'll get back to you on that one, Lawrence. And David, that concludes the questions we received this afternoon. So I will leave you with the final word and thank you always. Okay. Well, look, it's a it's been a tough market, certainly over the last few weeks. Um, I think that if I take the lens back, the commodity picture continues to look quite good long-term, although they're correcting. Uh, equities have gone through a pretty significant correction. Uh, unprofitable tech started to correct in January of 2021. So it's now been 18 months. Um, so that has been the weakest link. Uh, fixed income has certainly had a significant bear market, about the worst bear market it's had going back to the 1920s. Um, lots of damage done out there. And I think that sentiment is exceedingly weak. I think there are some green spots. The green spots include sentiment is exceedingly weak. Positioning is exceedingly light. There is no one on the planet that doesn't know that the central banks want to raise rates and intend to raise rates. These are all things that are built into the market. I think that the fact that we do have fairly sticky inflation is also built into the market. And people have made their decision. This is not something that's been a three week or one month correction, people have had months and months to reposition their holdings. So there's a lot of work has already been done in this market. And whether it's this month or next month or the month after, I think that we find a floor in here and we will have a very good two to three years coming at us. It's the most important thing to keep in mind. And the difficulty is you have to balance having flexibility with some cash and having some positions in the parts of the market that are stronger than the rest. So that if we start to lift, we can participate. And that's the balancing act that we have to follow week by week. So continue to tune in. We'll continue to show you anything that turns up in our work that points to new areas of strength or increased areas of risk. And with that, thanks very much, Pam. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everybody again next week. Thanks, David. Have a good night.